Hey, good morning. Welcome to another episode of The Debrief. My name's Tyler Norton, and that's John Bergman over there. <laughs> These cameras are weird on computers, it's like man. the Brady Bunch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so we were just kind of talking ahead of time. I actually managed to wake up for finals for 4.30 a.m. call time on a Sunday, which is not... Not cool, man. But it, I had a really good time watching uh, watching finals. It was a good one. It was. It felt a lot more exciting than uh, than last week's. Um, I I think the secret is keeping a, a bucket of ice cream so that when I wake up, I've got like something to to enjoy as I'm like half awake trying to get started. I don't know. It sounds like you had a harder time waking up this time. I did. I had a hard time waking up for it. I did not uh, watch it live. I thought about watching it live that would have required getting up at around four o'clock in the morning here and uh i just thought i'd prefer to be clear-headed i was kind of hoping that the replay would be up and it was yeah and there were no no problems and i actually really enjoyed the comp as well i liked the one last week a little at the chongqing one a little more than you did if i recall yes. but uh i like this one as well so there's a there's kind of a lot to talk about yeah i i think we like last week we spent a ton of time on speed i think we should start there again just because i i think we'll spend less time on it this week um first of all you owe me five bucks uh <laughs> I, yeah. I know i do i you, you walked into I, don't make bets on like the most the the least likely thing to have happen of somebody breaking a world record back to back I was, uh, that was a big appeal for me watch, watching speed climbing. I wanted to see how Yiling Song would do for anybody that is catching this and they kind of <laughs> don't, they, they, they're they coming into this with no knowledge of the yeah. comps whatsoever. That's uh, a lot of people. Yeah, right, of course. Uh, Yiling Song broke the world record in women's speed climbing last week, so you and I had bet that, uh, I, I thought... No, she... dude, there was no organized bet. You just, like, with no prompt, and you were like, I bet she yeah. will break the record again next week. I was trying to will it into the <laughs> I thought that would be really exciting. Uh, as it happened, she not only did she not break the, the world record again, but she had a, an early slip. I think it was in, like, the one eighth final or something it was way before the the last the last heat and yeah. she i think ended up getting like 16th or something like that uh, right. i think you i think you cursed her because i you were talking about i don't the, i don't want to savor somebody's failure but well, like you were talking about how uh the, i the, did bet the that she was gonna slip like i and yeah. just i and I mean, I don't wish that on anybody, but you went and took like the most ridiculous bet. Don't like, like I, yeah. that's super brave. Um, well, but yeah, well, so, so, so I, I'm good for the money. Uh, we'll have to, it, it'd be easier if I could give it so we don't have to deal with exchange rates and stuff. I, I'll give it to you in person if we can true. meet up at some point, uh, yeah. or I'll give you the offer. If you ever want to do a double or nothing for the second half of the season, <laughs> you can make up a new wager, not necessarily right. having to do with speed climbing. It could be, you know, anything and we'll just keep the keep it running sounds good i'll try not to bet on somebody's like complete miserable failure in the first round but it worked right. out super well for me so yeah we don't want to we don't want to relish in yielding songs failure it's too bad no. because that would have been really and i don't think we are relishing in the failure but it's no. too bad that would have been really exciting um in all i'm relishing in my own personal success i make yes you'll be call. five canadian dollars richer <laughs> yeah uh you said american anyways no, uh right. the first thing about speed that i really liked this time around was there were way fewer like straight up race breaking falls so through the later part of the of the women's round and the men's round you didn't have everybody dropping like flies like the women's final was really close the small final and the big final and the semi-final those were really excellent races uh alexandra radzinska from poland ended up earning the gold medal second was aries sasanti raheyu and third was anuk jober and then for the men, Dmitry Timofey, who was like a hilarious guy to watch, he was psyched the whole time. And I guess in the post interview, he was saying that he was just like killing his personal bests at this comp. So, I mean, he was a super funny dude. And as a side note, having Eddie being the sideline commentator has been great. I didn't want to harsh on him last week because the questions were like a little bit stilted in Chongqing. But I realized he was speaking to people through translators last week for the most part, whereas he had people to interview this time that could speak conversational English at least and it was really good like I was really glad to have him asking those questions he did a good job uh Basamawam was second and Ludovico uh Ludovico Fasali from Italy was third place mm -hmm. so uh yeah nothing like there weren't any out of this world performances nothing really stands out like I I I think seeing some of those those big names the record breakers I think you start to realize like 
Reza Ali Prashena has never been like the overall champion in a speed season. Like the cons it's hard to find consistency. And I think of some of these names as like really huge champions, but consistency and speed is hard to achieve, especially when you're going just head to head all the time. It's uh, you would expect to see these people consistently getting to finals. That's not really the case all the time. Yeah, it's that's been kind of something that's fun to watch with the speed climbing is that it's it's just n not that the bouldering or the lead is predictable, really, but um, I feel like speed, it's just it's it's extra unpredictable in terms of uh, just because this goes back to what we were talking about last week, because the falls are so quick and devastating. You know, it's like you have one little slip and all of a sudden you're instead of being maybe in the final, you're like number 16 or something mm -hmm. like yelling yeah. song. Um, and that just opens it. Why it's, it's wide open then for just somebody that's new or maybe a lesser known name um, to 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 do well. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes me want to keep track of like if there are any races where like the number 16 seed has managed to creep all their way into finals just out of, you know, lucky, lucky performances against higher place seeds. But uh, I think the, the one talking point that was really nice to see was was seeing the reaction times being posted again in the stream. So aside from having the clock showing how long it took everybody to get to the top of the wall it was also showing in you know thousandths of a second how quickly the climbers were reacting off the block uh from the start time and i i can't say i like noticed a lot of patterns there were times where the reaction time was very quick but they seemed to like really get out of the gate slower than the than the other person or that they were really slow starts but they made it up later so I didn't feel like there was a huge correlation between winning and losing because of your reaction time, but it was still a neat thing to see. It was another conversation point. It was uh, it was a good thing to add. We've talked about this before. Just the more infographics, the better on screen. Mm -hmm. It just makes the viewing experience more enjoyable, more interesting. Um, yeah, like I don't know if I necessarily did a lot with the reaction times. I think because also we, it's not something that has been consistent from event to event. That that you know they. They don't show those. I think that was the first time this season that we've had those. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe if they start, if the IFSC starts putting those on the screen at every competition, then maybe you know we'll start to like notice some stuff with them. Um, it'll be interesting to to notice if there are any, you know, if there are any people that are like slow starters. It's slow in quotes, right? Yeah. Speed climbing, but like slow compared to like who are the traditionally the fastest starters, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but we would need a couple of competitions to notice those kinds of patterns. I think. Yeah. And, and a great question is, is if they even keep track of those numbers, you know, from competition to competition, it may be like, so we, you and I were speaking as it happened, just wondering what the significance of a reaction time is and especially why there is a, a low cap on the reaction time. So if you, if you s start, so if you come off the blocks in less than, what is it? One tenth of a second. I think so. Yeah. One hundred thousandth. Um, point, point, Point 0.1, one, less right? than point 0.1. Yeah, right? if you're faster than Seconds. point 0.1 of a second from the block, it's considered a false start. And this comes from lots of other track and field where apparently science says it's like not human to react that fast. So if you do it in less time than that, it's because you had some, like you had uh, you had uh, advanced knowledge of the, the starting time. I'm not going to get into any arguments about that because I don't know anything about it. But um, Charlie, was I just shot him a message because you bring up a good point that we hadn't seen the reaction time thing on the screen this season. And he was just saying that even though he, he prefaced it by saying he's not a tech guy, like he's not the guy to ask tech questions. He's just a pretty face. Um, that some of the events have output capability for that and some of them don't. So while apparently every event has a reaction timer for judgment calls it can't always be ported out to the broadcast i guess is what that means um you mean, I, it, it wasn't it wasn't charlie just sitting there with a stopwatch <laughs> <laughs> yeah the guy's got incredible thumbs man yeah, he can rock a stopwatch right. like nobody's busy he's just got one in each hand whoa i just went mad out of focus there we there. go anyway uh so yeah speed of it cool i don't know uh alana yip posted a new personal best i think that was that was the one takeaway sean mccall had a rougher time he he had kind of like a season low uh so far um anything noteworthy from the americans in the speed event you know not 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 particularly noteworthy um i, I know we're kind of going to get into the americans and the canadian teams on the whole um mm -hmm. you know including their bouldering and stuff but uh no not nothing 
really that I have to say about the Americans. I, I thought I enjoyed the speed though uh, overall. Like you said, you know the tight tight races for the finals. Um, I think uh, the men's final. I think the men the final time for the men was like 5.59 or something like that. Um, and I think the world record is like 5.4 maybe. Um, 5.4. Four, eight, so if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, yeah, nice job, um, man. Good yeah, stuff. so you know that's like that's kind of exciting, right? The men are getting fairly close to the to the world record as well. Um, only uh, you know point two or point three off of it. So um, do you want to do you want to bet me five dollars that uh, that they break five <laughs> seconds next next week? Up? I'm done. I, I need to. <laughs> I need to uh, go back to the drawing board before I put more money on the table. Cool. All right. Yeah, but all in all, good speed event. Um, yeah. It was a good time. Uh, Alexander Rudzinska is, is like a big name in speed. Um, it was cool that she took another win. Um, and same thing for Dimitri. I think it's been, uh, was it the start of last season or a season? Anyway, it's been a while for him to secure a win. So so I can tell they were both happy. Um, yeah, let's, let's talk about bouldering really quickly. And we'll start with the, you know... We will we will put more time into talking about Canadian and American results when there starts to be more like noteworthy success, because <laughs> then we can yeah. can juice it. For now, uh, the 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 best result from my side on the Canadian side is Eleni at making finals again, coming or sorry semifinals, um, finishing in seventeenth after that round. Um, just running through all of them just to give them some some airtime. Uh, Allison Vest in thirty ninth, Bronwyn Carnes fifty seventh. B. Evans in 59th and Paige Bockless Chuck in 70th. And then on the men's side, rough week for Sean McCall ending in 37th. Uh, Jay Hollowatch 43, Lucas Uchida 55, Zach Richardson 61, and Nathan Smith 77. Um, Sean mentioned in an Instagram post that he was feeling like he's getting tired of the semifinals being like easy rounds. Um, mm -hmm. He seemed frustrated that basically that like you could have four or five tops and still not make it through to uh to semifinals um and i mean when you look at some of these results like for men especially you could have like three tops where so three tops the lowest score with three tops is 49th um and that's pretty deep i mean it's a field mm -hmm. of what basically 100 people 97 climbers um i don't really know how i feel about that like i mean you just climb, be the strongest and win the thing. Like, I don't really, I don't know. I, I, I have mixed feelings about that. Um, but, uh, I, I think in a field that big, when teams are almost being encouraged, not like not encouraged to bring athletes, but they're given five spots per country per gender. And, and, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with registration fees. That's a huge help to the event organizer and to the IFSC. Um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with the way scores are being broken down. Like, are you, are you suggesting that, that you should have really only like 10 guys at most with four tops and everybody just peters down from three until you have like 40 guys at the bottom with zero, 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 zero. I, I don't really know. And Sean's on the athletes commission. I'm sure he has like the best interest of everybody in mind. So I'm not saying he's like whining about his own results, but I'm not really sure where the balance is for that. This is a tricky, it's a tricky thing because we've talked about the route setting in previous episodes here and it's it's such a fine line and if you go too far the other way and semifinals are too, too difficult, which would be very easy to do, um, then you're going to have just people that don't get any tops and they're making it into, into semifinals or, or into the finals or whatever because they have, you know, like two zone holds or something mm. like that and like... Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, you have to also think of it from a viewing perspective uh, in the audience. Not in qualifiers, exciting. though. Like, nobody's watching qualifiers. Like, well, legitimately, yeah. nobody shows up to qual qualifiers. Is like a yeah. slew of coaches and climbers and, like, some random people that happen to walk by. But it's not a spectator event. Yeah. That's true. I mean, that's a good point. Um, I, I just think you... I don't know. I would be curious to hear what Sean, like, what is he specifically wanting in light of what you just said, which would be that, well, then you're just going to have a bunch of people that don't have any tops, you know, mm -hmm. um, how, how would Sean answer that? I don't know. Yeah. And I'm not even saying that that's necessarily a bad thing. Um, but if, you know, just for, for people's, and I'm not saying that athletes deserve positive experiences when they come to a world cup it should be the hardest event uh, mm -hmm. that they like ever attend that's totally cool but for you know just for them wanting to go to a world cup in the first place 
if you go and you're just not topping anything, are you going to, is that going to foster your own interest in it? And again, that's not necessarily the IFSC's job to like make people feel good about themselves. But uh, it's like, the thing is the round is still getting separation in general, the best climbers of the current day are getting through. Like, I mean, we kind of, in the last couple episodes, we've talked about like Jan Hoyer, Jakob Schubert, Sean McCall kind of being contemporaries of each other Mm -hmm. and that they're like late eighties, early nineties. And they had a lot of success over the last like five years, but less so recently. Jan and and Jakob made it into semis uh, and then they also made it into finals. So I, and again, not to say that just because you're born in the same era means you have the same strength or whatever, but all in all, I, I, I think it would be here, uh, be nice to hear a bit more of his complaints because again, he spent so Mm -hmm. much time with the IFSC athletes commission that you know, he has like a pretty broad understanding of all of the stakeholders interests. Um, But yeah, it's, it was uh, an interesting thing that you brought up. How did the, uh, how did the Americans do? Yeah, the uh, it sounds like the the Canadians had kind of a rough weekend, and the Americans did too, for the most part. To be honest, um, I'm looking at the results here. So Nathaniel Coleman uh, was the only one on the men on the men's or the women's side who advanced to the semifinals, and he ended up in 12th. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then beneath him in the scores, so I'll just a lot of the Americans were tied for for a place, but I'll just you know that's I, I won't go into that. But Drew Ruana was 33rd. Sean Bailey was 41st, Zach Gala was 53rd, and John Brosler was 81st. So similar to Chong King in the, in the sense that they were just kind of spread throughout the, the rankings. Um, Ashima Shirishi was the highest placed woman. She was uh, 21st, tied for 21st. Alex Johnson, 29. Kyra Kondi, 31. Santa Kopp, 35. And Margot Hayes, 39. So uh, a lot of the women... Um, you know, beginning with Alex Johnson in, in 29 and then and then ending with Margo in 39. A lot of there was kind of a big group there in the hovering right around the 30s. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but yeah, Nathaniel Coleman was the you know, he was the best uh, kind of the best takeaway of the weekend at 12. And he actually got a top in semifinals, which, as it turns out, was really yeah. difficult in men's he, semis. Yeah. What a I, round. Yeah. Let me what I'm, I'm looking back. What number was that that he topped um oh, let me see. it was um, it was number one it's the very first one that's right yeah because um because i got really psyched because he topped <laughs> the first one yeah and a lot of other people were struggling on it mm-hmm. and so i was thinking like oh wow you know nathaniel he really came here to crush um the rest of the round wasn't you know it just didn't kind of go his way well uh, let's like let's but... talk about some of the people that like didn't go through to finals and uh, let's talk about just the people that got zero tops in semis so Anze Pehark he was third place last week uh Vadim Timonov Albin Levier he's won a gold medal in a bowler world cup uh Meichi Narasaki uh who is like a youth champion Yerne Kruder he's a gold medal winner Gregor Vazanik he's a gold medal winner and Adam Andra like gold medal winner world champion zero tops in this round but you still had like uh tomoa and kai getting three tops in it it was the movement it wasn't it, it wasn't like uh big showy like runny do or whatever you want to call it like super dynamic trick style but it seemed to have very peculiar positioning um and it just you could see the climbers like getting up high and just being lost trying to figure out how to make these moves where you just feel like in such an unusual spot so it was a weird field because i thought you know if if andre gets the semis i just assume he's going to finals and if he doesn't go to finals i imagine he'd be on the bubble not 14th place with zero tops it was a pretty big surprise yeah i wanted to ask you about that one real quick though, uh, another big name who has become a big name this season who didn't make it who didn't advance was uh, oceana mckenzie i don't remember what place she got but she um, she was in there. If you if you have it there, she didn't make semis though, right? I want to say she's probably in the bottom. Okay. I'm just scrolling through. Yeah, that's the hard thing because like Oceana, I I think we both agree that was like an incredible result in Maringen yeah. coming into finals. Um, but like the the and I guess her World Cup of before that she made semis she finished uh 33rd with two tops and three zones in group a um like in the in the company of laura regora from italy who's uh, i think a youth champion laura stockler uh who was at the youth olympics maybe won something kyra condi alex johnson she's right in that neighborhood so like not unreasonable but i do i do think the first event you know 
because it was only one event until she proves otherwise you have to call it a bit of an outlier sure yeah and and the real thing i wanted to ask you about was uh what do you think you know what do you take of what do you make of andra's um surprisingly low uh placement overall um i i so i <sighs> he'd been sick for you know he, yeah they, they he, mentioned so... that on the broadcast he he skipped Chongqing because he after Moscow where he placed second I think was he second at Moscow yes. um and then and then he got sick uh so well they said Chongqing. it was like an upper respiratory thing so yeah they skipped one world cup which is like totally reasonable yeah. spend more time in Europe rather than coming straight to China um I don't know if I like I mean not like they gave us details on his illness but I don't think it was anything like that when you look at the other names of, of people getting wrecked in the round and men not going through it it makes me think it's not that much as much as for him in terms of placing it's a like it's not very common he comes this low but you look at other guys that got approximately the same scores like nathaniel coleman john one sean alexi rubsov like all these guys with a single top so not that far off from adam's placing i think it was just a a unique round of boulders um it wasn't uh, it, it was just like make it hard in the most awkward way seemed to be the the um the the modus operandi for that round it was it was a weird one so i don't read too much into it i think it was just a wacky ass round five minutes it's hard another thing that makes a big difference is they mentioned that the wall was new for this year mm -hmm. um and th they i think it was charlie on the broadcast who said so these competitors have no previous experience with the angles on on this wall sure um, you know, and I think that's a real, that's a thing, right? If you're climbing on a wall that's completely unfamiliar, that can, that can, um, pose a, a new, a unique challenge. Um, I'm kind of, to what degree, I don't know, you yeah. know, um, but I, I think maybe like a new wall, um, and an unfamiliar wall, I would almost, I would almost think that it would affect lead climbing, significantly whereas bouldering maybe not so much because yeah, at the end of the day you know you're not going that high off the ground you're not actually progressing that far on the I, wall i don't like using the wall thing i don't i don't think that makes much sense like these climbers have climbed on so many different walls in their lives competition and commercial i don't think angles are something that throws them off um i i think the bigger thing would be just hold selection and anytime you're in a, a different part of the world or you have different suppliers then there are going to be spots where you've like you haven't used this hold before and there was a few of those in the finals as well where like i'd never seen them uh before although finals ended up being kind of like a a reprise for entreprise it was like seeing all these classic shapes back out on the wall but uh yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't I think the holds maybe that had something to do with it, but I think the just the route setting was yeah, it was a unique round and it, it flummoxed people. It was kind of cool. It was a, a unique kind of difficult. Um, uh, but let's just kind of shuffle into finals. Um, yeah. Tomo and Arsaki earns another gold medal finally. It's been a bit of a wait. Uh, second place, fellow countryman Kai Harada, and third place, Jakob Schubert. How weird is that? Seeing yeah, seeing that back. name on the podium again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, fourth place was Kaida Doi, uh, fifth place was Kokoro Fuji, and sixth place was Jan Hoyer. Uh, so yeah, I mean, four Japanese climbers in finals and two Europeans. And for the women, uh, Yanni Garnbrett obviously takes the win, followed by Akio Noguchi and Ai Mori, who's, I, I think the word is she's 15, from Japan, very first year of eligibility, bronze medal. Yeah. Good job. Uh, Miho Nanaka in fourth place, Jessica Pills, and then uh, Julia Chanardi from France. Um, cool mix of new and old. Mm -hmm. Very cool seeing Miho back in it and doing pretty damn well. I think that for me, that was really the exciting storyline of the weekend was Miho's return, um, and more than that, her return and and looking pretty pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. I think she she had a phenomenal semifinals. She was at, at the end of semifinals. She was right behind Yanya. She was in second place. Yanya was in first. Um, and and then in finals she she had a great start to the finals. Um, as things went on, she kind of struggled a little bit. Charlie mentioned that she looked a little rusty at certain parts. I think she had a pretty costly foot slip at some point that Charlie said was maybe due to being rusty. Um, she also, you know, there just there were some shouldery problems and and her injuries have been to her shoulders. So who knows if that was still, you know, she she kind of was wincing at certain points with her with some of the moves when she'd come off the wall. Um, so she, you know, it, 
I think it's deceptive because I think it was a great comeback, and it might not seem like that when you look on the the, the scorecard and you see that she got fourth. You're like, uh, that is that great? But I think absolutely it's great. I mean, after having not participated in the first three World Cup events of the season, coming out looking phenomenal in semifinals, and then ended ending up placing fourth. Uh, and I mean, look who 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 was ahead of her. It's like Akio and Yanya. Um, yeah. I, I think it was a, rem- a remarkable narrative for the weekend was just Mio, she's back. And she is also somebody that is like one of the few that you could really see giving Yanya some, you know, some trouble or whatever you want to call it uh, in the in the remaining competitions of the season. She's somebody that could, it, it's, it, she, Mio has done it before. She's beat Yanya in World Cup competitions in the past. So it's not uh, out of the ordinary to think that she could do it again. And yeah, maybe, and maybe finally, finally, someone can like take you know that top <laughs> spot from Yanya for one of these events, and it could be Miho. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask you a question straight. Because yeah. so I was kind of hoping that nobody would mention this. I've been I'm like putting together kind of a, a an episode to do on just the context of where Yanya is, and there are some places where I think she's being overcredited too early, and some places where she's receiving less credit than she should. Um, but Charlie mentioned one, which is she does have the chance to be the first person to sweep. A World Cup season. Um, there's some caveats to that, but she could do it. Would you be more excited to see a spoiler like Miho or Akio beat the odds and take down a giant like Yanya, or would you be more excited to see Yanya sweep the season? Oh, that is that is well, it's that's hard to answer. Whose whose failure do you want to? Yeah, that's that's why it's hard. Yeah, I don't wish. I don't. I, you know, I I don't want to wish that Yanya does not win. Um, just like I don't want to wish that any other competitor does not win. Um, I'll I'll say this. This is like the most like political answer, you know. But I think for the sake of the sport and for like publicity of the sport, it would mm-hmm. probably get more press if Yanya would would sweep. Right, because that would just be like a remarkable record, something that's never been done. Mm-hmm. Um, so I feel like, in the climbing community and kind of the sports community at large, like like word would spread about that. Whereas if Miho beats her, you know that's it's a story for us, but like it's it's not as big of a story as somebody setting a a, a record, you know, going undefeated for the season. So. Um, I'm also extremely torn. I don't know. Like, yeah. I, so part of me, like, I don't, even if she, if she sweeps this season, this is one of the shortest bouldering seasons that's ever existed. And there have been people that have not swept a boulder season, but won more boulder events in a season than this, right? Because there have been boulder seasons with like a butt ton of comps, more than six. This is a fairly small one. So Yanya can can take six, but Anna has won more boulder world cups in a season than her. Um, I think Sandrine LeVay as well. Angela Eider in, in lead climbing has definitely won eight in a row before. I can't remember if they're in the same season. Um, so I, 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 I have mixed feelings. It's like a cool anecdote and it certainly you know, bolsters the the narrative of this being Yanya's era. Um, but the achievement of winning a lot in a row has already been achieved by other people. And Yanya's going to need more than just this season to kind of to uh, to match them. Although I guess she did win um, Munich last year, right? Am I getting that? Uh, yeah, she's, she's she does won. have one from last season. So it's right. so in a streak. She's actually at five right now. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I think, I think that's, it, it, it would be a cool anecdote. Like I would, I think for somebody like Yanya who might be struggling with motivation right now, maybe like you're definitely at that point where I, I shouldn't say that. I don't know anything, but if you were having that much success and if it almost came so easy, I feel like you want to give them, um, you want to give them as someone to fight against. Like, I think probably the greatest era of, of I don't know. I'm kind of torn right now between the era of Anna Shtor, Akio Noguchi, Yula Worm, Alex Puccio, Melissa Lenev, like that top six that would just tear Boulder World Cups up. But also in, in lead climbing where you just had Mina Markovic and Jane Kim just back and forth every single comp. And they were just like heavy rivals, even if they liked each other. That was an excellent storyline, whereas this storyline of, you know, Yan is just going to win everything. I'm not sure it's as dynamic. It's like, will she, mm-hmm. you know, will she manage to like slip once? Um, I'd rather have 
a spoiler in there and see some actual fight because that just makes the victory like even more incredible. It does. But on the other hand, I think as analysts of this sport and people who appreciate history of the sport, we should you I think it's almost like we're obligated to always cheer for the potential of greatness. Sure. Right. Like, oh, if, yeah. like we are like Yanya could do something that has never before been done before. Um, and, and that would be it's not only unprecedented, it's just it's incredible if she would sweep this season. So it's almost like uh, it's tricky because you and I like we kind of try to not at least I, I know I do. And I think you do as well. We try not to like cheer. Right. Because it's it's we try to kind of look at this as almost like reporters be unbiased. But um but you, it's like you can't help but get behind that, the potential mm-hmm. for Yanya to do something that would be so historic. I think uh, the, 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 I, cause I, I, like, I'm pretty biased and I love cheering for certain climbers and I have ridiculous reasons for liking one climber over another. Like, it's not rational. I'm a fan of certain people. I think that what freaks me out with the Yanya thing is I know because I am also a young product of climbing, I haven't been around for the whole thing, you know? I, I, I've become hyper aware of my recency bias just because I haven't seen the other stuff. So Jan is this incredible climber, but then I'm like, wait, what am I comparing that to? Like what? And so I've started transcribing every single result from every comp and I have finished it for bouldering and I'm almost done for lead. And then I have to do speed. And once I have that, I think I'll be able to say like, yeah, this, this is the most incredible thing ever. And I'm going to loudly vouch for this being one of the greatest achievements in the sport, or we'll be able to say, you know, this is an excellent climber, but let's put it into context. The audience was way smaller 20 years ago, but there was this person who was as much of a monster or more so. Um, and I think that's something where for myself, I want to create more content that gives more perspective around that to say, you know, this is an incredible climber, but here's somebody else you should know and let's compare and contrast their successes. Um, cause I'd love to start talking about like a greatest of all time, especially as the yeah. Olympic comes up. Cause you know, whoever like the NBC commentator is, is just going to spout off some absurd and like completely unfathomable um like achievements for some of these people like giving them titles and acclamations that they maybe don't deserve so i think it's important for us to to start figuring out some of this info ahead of time so i don't know i think Mm -hmm. i'd be excited either way seeing yana sweep a season would be dope i hope she then wraps it up with winning the world championship i think that would be a genuine accomplishment go six world cups and win the world championship and let's see if she can do it in lead as well like that would be an absolute home run for you know like undisputable greatest season because it crosses the discipline we'll see what happens but uh yeah um speaking of that this was one of those comps where after the first problem yanya was down by Mm -hmm. by an attempt in fairness but she was playing from behind for about five seconds and then we get to problem number two which i'll show like like, we'll just kind of this is a keo on the screen on women's number two Um, you kind of mentioned this one did you want to talk about this climb at all uh, yeah, so let me let me look at my notes here. Um, this was, I, th- I think this was probably my my favorite of the, really um, of the competition. And I should say that I I actually liked a bunch of the boulders. Um, me too. There were several that I liked. There was not one that that was like far and away my favorite um, because I because I just kind of had sort of a fondness for many of them. But when I sat down and had to choose a favorite. Um, I like this one. I liked it because it's it's kind of interesting. I kind of, I think last week I said I don't remember what number my favorite was, but I said I liked it because, um, because the commentators were noting how it was really hard to read the beta, and and I kind of like this one for the opposite reason. I liked that it was just I think uh, Charlie and whoever was doing commentary with him at the time they they mentioned I think it might have been Kyra Condi. It was I, I think, yeah. Um, they mentioned how it was just this one was just easy to read. It was hard and it was just like straightforward. If I'm remembering the the correct, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, that that yeah. was this one that they were talking about. Yeah, no, it um, was it was, and so you just saw Akio's attempt on the screen. So as if you yeah. were just watching it, you can see that it's a long climb. It's pinchy. There was a lot of hand readjustments. It was mad steep, and so it was one of those climbs where you could just get tired. And again, you saw. Uh, Julie, Jessica, Miho, I, Akio, all these people, none of them got a top on this problem. This is problem number two, right? Um, After a few of them did get tops on problem number one. 
And so it looked like an incredibly hard problem. It was very simple, but just it was strenuous. And after your first attempt, you were gassed and the chance of mm -hmm. you topping it later, uh, it did, just didn't happen. If you didn't top it on your first attempt, you weren't gonna top it. So it has this context from the first five climbers of it being just mad hard, even for the most high level climbers. Yeah, no, and then of course, Yanya hops on it. She's still behind. She's not in first place. And then she just floats through this entire thing. And it was, this, this was maybe, I, this wasn't my favorite boulder, but this was maybe my favorite moment from the comp because I just felt so, I don't want to say the word defeated, but I just felt like I had to let go of everything and just give in to this universe where this woman is so absurdly strong compared to the other people that she's competing against. She just made this look so simple. Everything in control compared to everyone else where it looked like some of the throws were desperate. It was beautiful. It's funny that we, that I think, we don't, for, for just people listening, you and I don't generally discuss what our respective favorite moments were no. before, the, before we record this, so it's a surprise to both of us, and yet we tend to uh, pick often this kind of the same moment, and that was my favorite moment as well. I have some other honorable mention moments that we can get into later, but Yanya's um, top of that boulder was my favorite, uh, and, and it was my favorite boulder. I just like... Even beyond just the the physicality of the the sequence itself, I just loved how that boulder, with all the competitors there, it told a great story with nobody being able to top it until Yanya comes, who's the last climber, um, and she gets the top. It's almost like it had this own. It, it's almost like it had its own little plot. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it had its own little subplot with that boulder. Um, and we've talked about this. Like, if you can get a single top on a problem and it's the last person, or a single flash and it's the last person, it can take a shit scrubby boulder and turn it into uh, like a, a genuinely memorable moment. Yeah, I mean, compare this to, not that I, again, not that we like wish any ill will on competitors, but imagine if Julia Chamardy had come and instead of actually not doing it, she had been able to do it yeah. uh, as the first competitor out. But then like, imagine none of the other competitors were able to do it, the next five. It would have just been like a dud. You would have just been sitting yeah. there. Um, like, <laughs> it would've, that so, would have been an incredible talking point, but It would have yeah. been, and just think about how much that story, that plot, if you want to call it that, of the boulder, how much that would have been different than how it was now, where it was just perfect. With Yanya being the last, it, it was kind of like this, it had this climax moment of, of finally getting topped by the last person. Yeah. Um, solid. Great route setting. It was just kind of like a traditional, it, you know, we've been over well, this. Well, that's the thing is, that's why I was saying it's not my favorite boulder because that's the kind of climb I would see in a gym and I'd be like, I'm not even spending, Not I, obviously I would not climb that particular boulder. I would get fucking wrecked. But if I saw a climb with that kind of style, I wouldn't pay it any attention because I'm just not interested. Yeah, I don't know. There's just this intangible quality to it that I liked. I liked that, you know, the feet were cutting. Um, it was just shouldery. It was muscly. Um, certainly not the flashiest problem. Um, but, uh, I, there's another problem that we can get into that might, you know, I, I almost chose it for my favorite as well. Um, we can for, for kind of different reasons, but, but I just really like this one. Well, yeah, just, we'll wrap up the women's round just by saying that. So when Yanya flashed that impossible boulder, it, the comp was basically over. I think it was it, like in my head, at least there was no more suspense. You couldn't really imagine that the next couple problems would somehow separate in the other direction. Uh, and it all wrapped up on, uh, on women's number four. I'll just show it here. And again, there was lots of struggling uh, on, this, uh, on this problem. And then Yanya just, again, floats the dyno at the start. So many women spent a lot of time right here at this crimp sequence trying to figure out how to just get their foot onto the dish. Yanya doesn't give a shit and just fully cranks through that undercling straight up to the top. Wins it dominantly with four tops. Akio with three. I with three. Just, I don't know. Well, was, uh, here's what's interesting about that problem. Because remember, let's go way back to Meiringen where mm -hmm. it was the men's final and Andra came out last I think and he and it was the crack problem and that was his style and he topped it and he won right mm -hmm. and everybody and we were kind of talking like whatever you want to say it was lucky or it was whatever that like that happened to be this style that he excels at and and he was able to capitalize on it this problem um and, and Charlie, again, mentioned this on commentary. It had, there were like two big shouldery Gaston moves in this problem, if I remember correctly. Uh, let's see. 
Well, well the, that's not a gas helmet. It's a, that's a big was, shoulder move. Yeah, some people anyway. were doing the dyno differently, but this part here with these little crimps, people were kind of trying to guess on the, the volume on the left, the, the big uh, walk over there with the green screw on that you can see. Uh, yep. But Yanya just bailed on that idea completely. Well, but it's it's interesting that it was a shouldery problem and it was the last problem. And Miho, who has had shoulder injuries, that's what she's been battling, a right shoulder injury, and then now her left shoulder is injured um, or, or, like, maybe injured. Uh, and then she comes out and it's just kind of unlucky that the last problem is this really shouldery problem, not suited to her style or her injury or whatever you want to say. Um and she ended up not getting a top. If it had been a different style of problem and the luck had gone her way, kind of like it did with Andra for that in the Marion route, uh, the, the boulder there, which it was a crack and he's good at crack. It's just kind of like, uh, I, I wonder if Miho just kind of got unlucky. It's like, it's like, imagine if your shoulder has been injured for like, you know, a whole half a season or whatever. And then this last problem that you need to top, it's like, it's a, it's, it's an I, ultra shouldery problem. I don't it's know. Like, I don't oh, like Yanya didn't make it look that shouldery in my opinion, but again, she tried it fairly. I don't know. She clearly had a different amount of confidence in how she was approaching the holds. Like the other women spent a lot of time just like, Oh, should I use this one or this one? Or should I position like this? Whereas Yanya was like, well, I'm just going to use this because I know I can. Um, so I, again, that, that maybe that attempt video that we just showed doesn't give a uh, full justice to how the other climbers tried it. Cause they didn't climb it that way. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Even if, uh, even if Miho had topped that, of course it still wouldn't be a winner. Um, but Akio did finish that in two attempts. I finished mm -hmm. it in three. <clears throat> uh, yeah, it was, I, I, I think the, the women's round, just because after that, like devastating victory from Yanya on the second problem, Mm -hmm. the women's round didn't leave much uh there wasn't much mystery in it it was uh it was kind of the round for me was over when she flashed problem number two well and especially like i'm looking at my notes for problem three and so julia shannon did not top it but then i mori topped akio flashed it and topped jesse jessica pills topped it miho topped it on her second attempt and yanya flashed it so it was just like the third boulder was just kind of one of those ones where everybody almost everybody seems to make pretty easy work of it um yeah I just want to yeah find I, that problem I, yeah i think Anya this, was, yeah uh, this here is women's number three yeah yeah this uh, was actually a pretty like a very visually striking I, I don't think i like how these features look um but for anybody wondering the black surfaces have texture and the yellow surfaces don't um kind but, of uh, parallel ra rails and and at the top there was kind of that the, the parallel rails up there, you just kind of like shimmied up it, mm -hmm. um, you know, one arm at a time and, and, uh, didn't, uh, other than like Julia struggled on it, but, um, everybody else made it look pretty, pretty easy cruise control, um, either flashing or like getting it on their second attempt. Um, yeah. So, um, but yeah, let's talk about the men's, the men's side. Cause this again, I, and it feels terrible, but I think because there's some, some actual suspense as to what's going to happen, um, it is easier to really enjoy these, uh, these climbs. And, and you asked me to pick some videos from men's number one. Um, and I just added one. I wanted to add Jan Hoyer climbing men's number one, just for context. Cause he got very yeah. close to topping this thing. Uh, so let me just pull it up here. And again, nobody topped men's number one until Tomoa, but here is Jan's almost successful attempt. Yeah, and he had a couple of attempts where he he kind of couldn't make up his mind which hand he wanted to go for the top hold with, if yeah. I remember correctly. Um, <laughs> yeah, you see here he's going to try and go for a reach with the left hand, then he comes back down, goes for a yeah. heel hook, and tries basically the uh, crossing with the right hand, if I remember right. Or does he go for the left hand press? Goes for the right hand, yeah. Right there hand. you go. This is, I love this boulder problem. This is my style where it's basically like three moves. You gotta do that big backwards press to the second bit, um, which you can do as like a static press, or as we'll see later, you can do it pretty dynamic. Uh, then you go to that bonus pinch, and then you have to figure out a fairly complex kind of like rock over press or lean back press into the finish. I love how simple a problem it is. Um, but we'll yeah. show you Tomoa's first attempt because I kind of threw everybody for a loop. At this point, everybody had been either going for like a straightforward dyno, trying to latch the top, or pressing backwards. And then Tomoa goes for the... Uh, pretty classic i'm just gonna dyno into the undercling and just go straight into like a full press <laughs> and it, it's amazing too I, I don't think you're playing the sound but anji i think it was anji pehark who was on the commentary and he 
he was just like floored by it. He was just yeah. like in awe of that move. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, there's going to be a little bit of volume. I haven't really figured out how to like okay. screen grab with good volume. But anyways, yeah, that was really surprising because we'd seen a lot of failure. Like again, for this problem, uh, pretty much everybody got the zone, but there were a lot of attempts burned just trying to figure out that start position. Um, but anyway, here's Tomoa's. Tomoa's actual winning burn on it, basically the same beta. And uh, Tomoa, this event reminded me of like, you have that commercial for toilet paper where there's like a little puppy running on hardwood floors, like trying to scurry around corners uh, and just like losing control. Tomoa is just so recklessly powerful sometimes. Um, it's it's ridiculous watching how he chooses to go through these climbs. Cause you know, he's got the strength to do things perfectly, but then there are some times where he just like, kind of like, goes into overdrive and maybe kind of like a little bit of a little bit of oversteer just careening around and just like flying past holds we saw it a bunch in different attempts where he just like would ramp up for a dyno and just overshoot or whatever it was he, yeah he's fun to watch he's so fun to watch and it's so interesting because i always think of him in the context because you know the kids that i coach and i think like if if there was a kid like that, he it's like you would want to like sit them down and be like, all right, you need like let's. I, I mean, you know, I would never say this to him because he makes it work. Yeah. But uh, but like it's not a style that you would want it. Generally, it's not a style that you would like encourage in your in in training, right? You like not if we, they're kids because their muscles probably aren't like developed enough to handle the kind of forces they're probably putting on. Of course, Tomoe like yeah. has a has like an incredible body for that. But uh, but yeah, it is it is nuts. And what frustrates me, and I've seen this with with you know, other climbers is you, you feel like they're extremely developed on the physical side and they can create this energy and this power. Um, but that occasionally they just like, you know that they always have the capability to flash stuff, but then they just fluff it. And it happened last week, like Tomoa gave up the gold last week. And this was just for not starting a problem correctly last weekend, right? Just he didn't tap his feet on the on the designated start holds. But there were a couple problems today where, uh, or yesterday, um, where you know he if you wish he had just slowed down for a second you feel like he's just like revving and like friggin sixth gear getting ready to get on this thing and you wish you would just tone it down for a second and say okay man you're on like a slab problem with like ep walks this isn't the time to go nuts just chill out you could have yeah. flashed this um it didn't matter this week of course he absolutely like destroys the comp um yeah. trying to find real fast that i'll say that that was my uh just because since we're talking about that one men's uh men's number one that was my that was the other one that I was kind of thinking, like, oh, this this might be my favorite. Okay. Because um, I liked – Tomoa did that opening, uh, that, like, press. He did that dynamically yeah. right there. But but everybody else pretty much did it statically. They reached up with one arm, uh, and then they went dynamically to that zone hold like he did there. Uh, and then the high, the high foot, the high heel. So I thought that it was just this nice mix for everybody else other than Tomoa. It was this nice mix <laughs> – static and then dynamic mm -hmm. um i like that the top was actually pretty hard you had to crank that heel hook and then you know that uh lean over that was a that was a hard top which is always kind of fun to see you know it's like you get the zone but it's still not uh it's still a big move to the top yeah. um it was definitely a crowd pleasing problem uh and the fact that only tomoa tomoa was the only one that that topped it just like we were talking with the women's problem, it, it kind of told its own story. It had its own plot with one yeah. guy. Topping. It was it was one of those climbs where I, I again I like because it's simple. There's very few moving parts to it, and it comes to the climber to interpret it how they want. Uh, there were effectively like two cruxes. The one was the start move, and then from the bonus to the finish, and ultimately there were only three from the start to that press, and then just holding the pinch for the bonus, which some people found easy and some people didn't, and then reaching up for the finish. Like three moves. That's an easy story to tell. It's easy to you really like focus in on how people are doing on different moves. Um, the other one, and I also kind of an equally simple problem was men's number three. Um, this was kind of where the win took place. Tomoa uh, managed to top this pretty dominantly. Um, it was, again, like I said, it was kind of an entreprise throwback. There were walks, and again, there were Taijidus and stuff on the wall. Uh, it was cool seeing all these like kind of what I consider now like old school comp holds um but something came up on this and i'm gonna just play kai's uh attempt where he topped it uh let's show this thing this is kai harada on men's number three and so as you can see it's uh, starting on walks it's on a slab he's gonna press out of this there's a tiny little foothold to the right of his right knee so he's gonna get into that green walk get a right foot up and then try and wrap himself around the first green walk. And the finish is getting two hands on the second walk. Um, 
So he's gonna crank through this and just keep an eye on how he finishes because this got a little contentious. So again, the right is both hands on the right hold. And tell me if he tops this or not. Whew. Yeah. The, Spoiler, this, the judges did not think he topped that at first. They uh, did not They did not award the top, and then uh, there was a, some deliberation, and eventually he was awarded the top. Yeah. Um, still being debated online as of this morning. I've looked at the IFSC's Instagram page and stuff, and there's, there's still people commenting – uh, various opinions. Yeah, and uh, this is the full body replay. So just take a look at his body positioning. His hips aren't falling out. Oh, though they kind of like they are a little bit. His hands aren't super secure. But for me, and again, like the when it comes to judging control, again, it is a judgment call. There's a reason that there isn't a lot of detail in the rule book giving like specific things. There's no three second rule or five second rule or anything like that. Ultimately, it comes down to the judge and just deciding are they in body control with both hands on that hold. Um, and this one's a tough one for me because first of all, there were no other attempts from other climbers that were as contentious. They either clearly didn't or clearly did top it. So because there is there isn't really anything close enough to compare it to, you can kind of use it as a judgment call and say, hey, he was pretty well close. He clearly achieved more than other climbers before him. But the, the big one that kills me is like, normally when you top a climb, you wait for the top signal or you turn around to get some kind of affirmative confirmation from the judges. And he didn't turn around to check. And the call for the top from the judge, I think I can hear it in the recording, comes immediately after he starts to fall back. And that's the one that kills me, uh, is that the judge was gonna give him the top, which is frustrating, but he started falling before that. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of I'm kind of mixed. I honestly don't actually care. It's in my opinion the judges call, and then they were right to check that thing out. I'm not sure if Japan even got a chance to appeal it. I'm willing to bet that the jury just kind of did a double check immediately. Um, so I'm not 100 percent sure. I don't know, uh, but I think they dealt with it in a good way. I think it's fine. Um, I don't know how what uh, what's what are the wise a, people on the internet saying? Well, there's a lot to unpack us, here, I and I think yeah, I think um, so. I've so uh, well for starters i'll show uh, let me look at my phone here because i um i'm just going to replay that whole video i opened this up to just out of curiosity i put this on my instagram story and asked people if they thought it was a, a controlled top or not if he should have been awarded the top or not um what do you think the results were just out of curiosity uh oh that's a really good question um was it mostly like an american audience like, all of you damn so. one-handers. I've got a lot of, uh, probably mostly Americans, but I have a, you know, there the Europeans chimed in, uh, people in Asia chimed in, so. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think I want to say that the reaction would be fairly mixed. That's mm -hmm. that was kind of my guess because, like, in the in that shot that was just shown on the screen where you don't see his lower body that well, it doesn't look that much like his weight is falling away. He is shaky in the hands though, um, so I, I feel like you would probably get like roughly half and half. Yeah, so there were not tons of people. There was about, um, you know, a little more than 30 people that voted. 20 22 people voted it should be awarded a top, and 10 people said no. Okay. So, like, uh, you know, there's a fair amount on each side. Um, and I think there is also a lot of confusion out there from the general public and the general IFSC comp watching public about what you have to do to be awarded a top. And just in looking in comments that have been sent to me and just, and you know chatting that I've had with people since this happened, some people said, oh, I thought you have to control it for five seconds. Other people have said, oh, I thought you have to control it for three seconds. And other people just say you have to, you know, it's the judge that has to rule that you give, that you get control, you match and show control. Um, so I think a lot of people don't really know what the actual rule is for sure. for, yeah. for what you have to do. Um, Should and, I read and the to rule? Be clear, Should I find the fucking rule and have there, to read there, this? Well, there is no... The judge is not holding a stopwatch, right? So the, the no. second count is... I don't know. Well, let's let's talk about why this why this is kind of relevant. First of all, yeah. most people that know things about judging and climbing are local judges. They're people that volunteer their time to mm -hmm. to to help out their own kids or their comp in their community. And judging climbing is really fucking hard. Like judging whether or not starts are relevant, the difference between like control 
finding stability, using, like, what the fuck is using? Like, judging yeah. for climbing is genuinely very mm-hmm. difficult, especially if the boulder problem has a lot of, like, leeway in it. So it's not unreasonable for head judges or trainers to give people guidelines as to how to interpret these really difficult terms when they start out. So I don't give a shit if you go to a local and the judges decide that we're going to use, like, a three-second rule. Climbers should always turn around, make eye contact with the judge, and ask for some affirmative confirmation that they've finished the climb. Like, that is... Yeah. That should be drilled into kids' heads from the start, especially in the States where you guys, for some reason, are cool with like one-handed tops or whatever you guys do down there. Um, yeah. That's really important. So I don't mind that people have a bit of a misunderstanding of it um, because those can be really helpful frameworks to get started as volunteers. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, at the high level, it is 100% a judgment call. If a judge wants to call top, you know, half a second after they get into the position they're in their right to do that it might be a little bit reckless but it's their judgment of their body positioning if they have a stable and in control position where they've got like both hands touching onto the hold that's legit that works Mm -hmm. um and so like this is the kind of thing if you judged kai's attempt very very quickly you could have said yes or you could have said hey he's kind of shaking i don't know if he's holding it that said he held it for what like one one and a half maybe two seconds in there it wasn't very long but i can see it either way um he didn't look that controlled again in a previous attempt i can't remember which climber it was uh i should just pull this up just to give them credit this was number three so it was probably uh it was probably Keita Dohi. When he finished this, he stemmed his right foot out to the opposing wall. So he had his left foot on a solid foothold, right foot stemming into the wall. He created great balance and had like a beautiful, like genuinely in control top. So if that's the baseline, then yeah, Kai's was shakier than that for sure. Um, yeah. But nobody else was in that position. It was up to them. How, how do you feel about it? Yeah, I kind of flip flopped on it, to be honest. When it first happened, I, I in kind of in the moment, I thought, Oh, this is, it's definitely a top, no question. But then in just leading up to uh, us recording today, I've watched it a bunch and I kind of then went the other way, especially since I looked at my Instagram and saw all those people that voted that it wasn't a top, uh, the 10 people. And then, so I was those like, are oh, 10 yeah. powerful people. Yeah, well, I was like, yeah, I, these are people that, you know, I know I know a lot of the people that, sure. that voted. And, and so I know that these people know what they're talking about in, 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 all, in all fairness. And so I was like, ah, maybe it wasn't top. But then I've kind of come back the other way. Uh, I think it, I think it was a top. The thing that is kind of tricky is, you know, in other sports, you have this refrain that like the tie goes to the offense, right? Mm-hmm. Like there's ever a scramble and it's like, so in climbing, I think the equivalent of that would be that like the, that you should always, the default should be whatever the call was made should stand Mm -hmm. unless there's like definitive evidence to overturn it. Right. And the call, the actual call in the moment was, uh, a top, Mm -hmm. you know? And so to overturn that, it should be pretty hard. Like you should have definitive evidence when you watch it replay. Well, just to be clear, like, and this is the part where I'm confused is because I think I hear in the recording, if you watch the playback, I don't think you would have been able to hear it in the playback I did. As he's there with his hands shaking on the hold, he starts to fall back and then I hear something that says top. I'm pretty sure I heard that. Again, it's a different language. I don't know. And again, the cameras and mics are further away. Mike, the problems. Um, I think I hear the word top being said as he's falling back, which says, yeah, that maybe the judge initially called it a top. But when he got to the ground, they said no, right? So the initial call was and again the, yeah. let's assume that the thing i'm hearing is or is not real when he got on the ground the judges said no so yeah. that's like that is the initial call i think it was a great attempt to appeal my thing is i really wish they had cameras in the uh in the deliberation zone i like that's like they paused the comp right which is reasonable because he was mm-hmm. in his climbing time um i wish there was cameras watching uh i don't know who is the I think the technical delegate was was Graham Alderson, and then they had some people locally from China or Japan there. I wish I got to see that deliberation process. That would be so exciting because that was the most tense moment of the entire competition, right? Yeah. There was no more suspenseful moment than in that minute or two where we're just having to listen to Charlie and Angie try and fill time while the wall is empty waiting for this call. I wish we got to see that. That would have been really... And maybe that's like kind of exhibitionist or whatever, but I think that would be fun to watch. Yeah, it definitely made for a compelling viewing experience. Like that added a lot. 
like last week we were talking about how Yiling Song's world record kind of notched up the enjoyment of the comp um, for us. This definitely notched it up for me. I mean, it was just like I was on the edge of my seat. I was like, are they going to give it to him or are they not? You know, um, it gets weird, though, because to your point, like if they gave him the top, let's assume what you hear on the broadcast or what you said you heard kind of very faintly was the judge giving him the top. But then when he kind of hits the ground, they say, oh, no, never mind. Mm-hmm. Like, you can't do that. Come on. I like, think you, you can't. Can- I think you, you can't you can't say it and then like a split second later say oh never mind like my my issue is that I have definitely experienced the thing where in my head I'm like okay this is a top and in between me thinking that and me saying the words they like fall off in a unceremonious fashion without checking with me so like the words are coming out of your mouth as they're coming off the wall and you just want to like take your words back in because you instantly regret your call. Yeah, but that happens in other sports too, and it's. I mean, I mean, I hate to keep referencing other sports, but I think we kind of have to if we're if we're wanting competition climbing to to like continue to develop and and have these standards. Um, you know, you don't see that in like in 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 other sports like in soccer and stuff. The a ref makes a call and then they don't immediately take it back, or very very rarely do they immediately take it back because. That's just inviting. Uh, that just it comes across as indecision. And in sure. moments like this, the judge is the one person who has to be decisive. That's that's your job as yeah. the judge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To not have that. It's indecision. not. But but I mean, like it's a very American thing. To, like indecisiveness is bad. But like having a chance to deliberate and actually maybe second, you know, take a second opinion for your call is good. But no, I think you're right. We should get the jury president in like a white and black striped shirt. We should force them to walk to the center of the mats with a microphone, declare their call, and either take in all the boos or cheers yeah. that they get for that. I think that I think it'd be cool to see a bit of uh, a bit of the behind the scenes for that as much as it might put yeah. unduly pressure on the uh, on the the referees. Mm-hmm. Um, they've survived it in other sports and it seems like in some sports refs make actually good money. So Yeah, and and at the end of the day, I think the personally if I was pressed, I think the right call was made. I think it was mm-hmm. a top. I think it should have been awarded a top. A very close um, but I've watched it a bunch. I think uh, I could certainly see the case for not a top, but um, I'd, if I was if I was the judge and I was standing there, and I'll ask you this too, if you were there and you had to make the call, uh, what would you have said? And I probably would have said a top. I don't know. Um, <laughs> so wait, are you asking? If, right are away. you asking if I was the judge or if I was the uh, or part of the jury? If you are, well, let's... Or executioner. Yeah, let's take out all the technical aspects. Let's just say the decision is 100% up to you, right? Like, it's, like, you are the you are the ref and the jury. <laughs> Judge, jury, and executioner, Tyler. Uh, is it a top or is it not a top? Yeah, I hate hypotheticals like this. I, yeah. like, I want to say that I would have waited longer. Like, I, in, in, and I'm a little bit cruel about this when I judge and I do actually do a lot of uh, judging as I'm sure you probably get a chance to as well. Um, Although I've gotten to do more now that I don't coach Um, in general, if there is a contentious one, I will wait a really long time for you to demonstrate control, especially if it's a climb that finishes on a jug or if it's got like a stable uh, foot position at the end, I'm kind of going to make you wait a bit to really demonstrate it. Um, So I would have waited longer than they did is kind of my typical habit. Of course, if I was judging for a World Cup, that's a ridiculous amount of pressure. I don't know what I would have done. But I usually wait at, and I'm not counting seconds, but I'm just giving them a chance to fuck it up, basically. Yeah. And again, I'm judging for kids, and it's not very nice. But it gives you a much better chance of understanding what they're actually doing up there. So I, I would personally say make them wait, especially in a position where he didn't have stability coming from the right foot it was just from his left and from the hands pressing i i hope i would have waited longer and given him a chance to like truly demonstrate like uncontestable control or just fall off i think you know and i find myself sometimes having this tendency and i think other people are probably the same maybe not necessarily when judging comps but just when you're like climbing with your friends or doing a local or something like that where it's like you you have somebody who has one hand on the top hold and then when you, when they start to move their other hand like toward the match mm-hmm. it's almost like your brain instantly goes okay like match you, they got it you know oh it's like, really it's it, like I'm, I'm just thinking now like i'm thinking i'm trying to put myself in that position if i see somebody uh you know getting the tie it's like they match and they look secure with that one hand 
And sure, then they okay. bring that other that other hand, they start to move it there. Not that I call the match right away, but yeah. in my brain there's almost this like, okay, like they're secure enough to move that hand to the match. And their that's other fair. hand is secure. So like they'll probably match. And it's almost like I think maybe that's when the judge like started to to maybe enunciate like, oh, this is the match. I don't know. It's it it was an interesting uh unique moment in this competition. I and <laughs> I wouldn't envy being that judge because I'm no. sure it was kind of stressful, <laughs> but uh but it sure made it made the viewing experience fun for those couple of for those couple of minutes, and I'm glad it didn't drag on into this big controversy after the competition. I mean, like I know people are still chatting. We're, we're about still it. talking about, but, it, we but talked we're about like talking about minutes. it in a way. <laughs> I don't know. It, yeah, the discourse seems friendly, maybe, right? as opposed to like I don't know how. Uh, for, like for the most part, it is being talked about in like behind the scenes of people that work in the industry, which is fine, right? I don't think, and I, maybe that's really the only audience for these comps, like especially North Americans who watched it live. For the most part, it's people that work in the industry, probably, because um, the viewer base isn't that big. But uh, yeah, it's been it's been like a reasonable discussion. Um, yeah, because I think it could go either way. Like you can see, yeah. you can see why they would call a top. You can see most logical you know, minded people can see why they might not award it to him. And, and, and so, um, the fact that it could go realistically either way and it's easy to see either way, um, like it doesn't seem egregious one way or the other. No, no, you know? it doesn't. It's like, and I can totally accept it. Even if he didn't get the top, he still would have had the exact same placing. Um, yeah. he had three tops, the next person below him only had one. I don't think it's uh, too unreasonable, but let's, so we got to see that, that shaky attempt. I wanted to show you, somebody actually topping it so this is tomoa um unfortunately this wasn't a flash because he fluffed the uh fluffed the first move so this is his second attempt um and this was just another one of those examples of like <laughs> not not what am i trying to say just overkill but it was extremely fun to watch mm -hmm. um taking it slow and then he just decides that well first oh, of all that was oof. pretty sketch yeah but he makes up for it by deciding that these are jugs and he's just gonna haul ass on these things and just get on top of it and then down climb the back of the wall basically just mantle this thing i'm on top all the way up there <laughs> and that was the moment tomorrow won the comp pretty much yep. all he had to do is what get a zone hold on problem number four to lock it in yeah he uh he did and he didn't end up topping men's four he just no. got the zone but it was enough to uh it was enough to win. So, yeah. and his last win, I, I think Charlie said his last win was Moscow 2018. So it's been a while. I, my table's on the other computer, but yeah, that that I'm sure it was. I think it was one. Of, he was one of the guys that won something in 2018. But uh, yeah, no, it was cool and uh, and a decent interview. It's too bad he won't be in uh, in Munich, unfortunately. But whatever, we'll see him in Vale. Um, that's when you can give me five dollars. Let's go to Vale yeah. and, uh, and do it there. Um, okay. Aside from that. Uh, so you already said what your favorite problem was. You think it was women's number two. I think I'm pretty sold on it being... And between men's number one, because it's simple, the blue one that we were showing earlier, or men's number three, the one we were just looking at, um, because it was kind of a throwback. I, either one of those is fine with me. I both I liked both of them a lot. And uh, and they got separation. They were both fairly thrilling in how climbers got on them. So, so those are my winners. Mm -hmm. um, grade of the comp itself. How did this event feel to you? Well, Were you did, engaged did, the whole time? Yeah. Did you have any other real fast? Because I think we both said uh, that Yanya's flash of women's number two was our favorite moment. Um, did you have any other honorable mention or anything else about before we get into the grades? Yeah, I did actually. So uh, Kai had that awkward uh, thing where he finished his time and they were appealing and Tomoa was next out to climb and I've actually got a clip of this because it just made me laugh so hard it's like it's like when you walk into the room and your parents are fighting and you just turn your ass around. oh that's not the one where is it this one right here he's about to come out yeah. and then he's like oh shit what's going on I'm out of here and he just backs her right off to wait again so I laughed pretty hard at that that was a good time um, but uh, I think that's the second most one um, there was a it's probably gone now. Uh, Kokoro in semifinals, he like sacked himself falling. I think it was men's number mm -hmm. four. I can't remember what the climb was, uh, but he like took this fall and totally bagged himself on the way down. Um, I laughed at that too. 
Anyway, that was in, that was in his Instagram. This is what I love about rock yeah, climbing, man. I just right. like the funny, <laughs> stupid moments. Um, the uh, uh, something else that I so I had, I liked uh, Tomoa's stand up press on Men's One onto that volume. Mm-hmm. I just thought that was really cool. Probably because this past week with the kids I was coaching, we were working on uh, like a dynamic going dynamically like into a mantle. Sure. Um, which is <clears throat> I don't recommend it to people watching because <laughs> if you don't know, you know, like it, <laughs> you do risk shoulder injury if you don't sure. kind of know how to do it really um but so so i was just kind of like dynamic into like the sudden stop uh it it was just kind of in my mind so i thought it was really cool when he did that yeah it was Um, another honorable mention though for the favorite moment was yanya's flash of women's four which was uh she did it in 16 i so it was another speedy flash starting from when she matched on the start hold to the top, uh, I think I, I timed it and it was like 16 seconds or something like that. So it was very short. We've, we've said this before, how we wonder what the what the record is for a top of a boulder. Um, 16 seconds, that's pretty darn fast. Yeah, like, that's unreal. Man. Like, I mean, that's there have been boulders before where you you know you're barely off the ground and, and in in 15 or 16 seconds, and Yanya tops what was a pretty hard boulder so yeah um i thought that was just cool the 16 second just this blitz this blitz top uh was pretty awesome yeah for honorable was, mention yeah and I, at that point i had already like checked out like it was it was so obvious that she was not gonna blow it after seeing uh like akio and i top it um yeah no that's uh those are those are good ones it was really good climbing this uh this week like it wasn't too many flashes um but like a good number of tops people having to work really hard in general i think the problems nobody could complain about they were really different from from boulder to boulder it was a really good spread i i enjoyed watching the problems uh and and it was most fun in men's where there was some some uh suspense until at least the end of the the third problem so i thought it was a good one all around and of course speed was good too no like no exemplary world record moments but uh but still a fun one to watch not many falls which i'm i'm very happy about so so yeah all and i think and i've kind of started to regret giving Maringen only an a minus hmm. because i i feel like i'm forced to give this comp a b because it didn't m- match that like magical level of that crack moment like that moment was so off the wall as a great way to finish a comp right i feel like i need to retroactively bump that one up well and, well if they can do it for kai harada's uh top they yeah can go, exactly <laughs> Yeah. Of, uh, after deliberation the jury has yeah. decided to award Maringen, and i the, my, the only problem is I'm like, it's made me think about what is the limit for how good a World Cup can be. And I, I don't want Maringen to be like the absolute best. I know there's better than that, where both sides having both sides, both genders have <laughs> both genders have have a very exciting round. All the problems are excellent. Every component is just like off the wall exciting. I know that can happen. Um, how frequently, I don't know. So I feel like I'd bump Maringen up to an A so that I can give this comp an A minus. I'd feel bad giving it only a B plus. Yeah, so we didn't we didn't discuss these before either, but nice A minus. Uh, <laughs> I uh, I liked uh, a lot of stuff went into that. I liked as we discussed. I, I liked the as controversial as it was. I, I it made for a really compelling experience watching the deliberation about Kai's you know number three, his top. Um, I liked Miho's return. I thought that was really exciting. Yanya continues to just be Yanya and dominate, which was great. Um, we had a newcomer with uh, Aimori, 15 years old, did incredible. That was exciting. Um, I think the thing that makes it an A- minus for me and not an A, that doesn't bump it up to an A, was that, uh, we, as we said, Tomoa, he won by getting the zone hold on the last problem without having to get the top. Like, mm-hmm. that was a little anticlimactic, you know? Um and the thing is that boulder could it like let me just find it really quick it's going to be hard to explain sorry let me shovel through these where is men's number four okay men's number four behind uh behind kaita there is the gray uh taijidu volume in the dead center of the screen um and then two red volumes uh to the right of it so you basically that was your start position and the entire move of this climb is going from the zone hold which is the crimp above the gray taijidu 
and crossing through with your right hand to that giant red scoop where you had to pinch the balls off this thing, yeah, try really and like hard. try and release this this rotation and then generate off that red hole, terrible pinch in a very steep roof to the EP, I can't remember what the name of that stupid hold is, but it's like a gray jug at the very top left corner. And so lots of guys were getting the right hand onto that uh, giant orange uh, uh, sloper pinch, but getting out of there was like so impossible where you got to the point where like, was it Kokoro or Tomoa where they were basically trying to just go from the zone all the way to the gray thing. It was yeah. uh, it was incredibly difficult, but you can imagine if somebody had topped that problem, it would have been like nuts. And it was very close. Like they were getting their hands awfully close to it. Um, so it, I mean, it was a good problem. It just didn't go this time. Now, didn't Kai top it? Uh, problem. He, he, I think Sorry. he flashed it, right? Oh shit, he did. I'm an idiot. Okay. Yeah. Well, see, no, no. Um, I obviously didn't watch this competition. No, but your point was well taken because it was uh, it was exciting because uh, Kada came out first. Um, he did. He got. The, I think he got the zone. Didn't top it. Jan came out next, and he he kept working at that red scoop. And I kept thinking like, oh, this time he's gonna get it. This time he's gonna get it. And he, he just couldn't make any progress on it. And you know if Jan is like struggling to move off of a like a pinch, then it must be just a, a heinous move. Uh, and then Jakob um, had a uh, – he had a really good final attempt, but I think his foot popped or something like that. Um, but he struggled, and then Kai came out and flashed it. Um, so it was uh, – the more that I think about it, that was actually a really cool pro problem also. Like I didn't, I didn't really consider it for my favorite, but um, – but now that I'm kind of discussing it, I, I did really like that I'm one. I'm just trying to find. I'm going to try and show, show his uh, his climb at least the uh, yeah a little attempt here. So let me just pull up this thing. Give me one second. So he was the only, Kai was the only one to top that one. Um, now that I'm looking at my notes. Okay, let me see if this plays back. I don't know if you can see it or not, John. But anyway, this yeah. is is this Kai. Or is this... Yeah, here we go. So this is the move. Gets the cross. Manages to actually keep the feet, which is really important. And then generating off this, like holding this by itself was impossible for everybody else. And then managing to like bump up. It was actually pretty incredible. Yeah. I mean, he just basically, other than other than bringing his heel on there for like a brief second, he just basically campused um, from that big orange thing to the gray, right? Like he just yeah. let his feet dangle and, and just powered through. Yeah, it. for everybody else, getting one hand on that on that red scoop was like fine, but getting the second one, you were just sliding off. They just could not pinch it hard enough. Um, yeah. yeah, good call. I'm, I feel bad that I didn't actually remember that. So it was no, good that's, thing. That's Got great. I'm glad, we, it. I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad we replayed it uh, since we're talking about it so much. Yeah, I hope the audio came through on that. I didn't do much to check that, so hopefully nobody got like completely Blast. got their ears wrecked or didn't hear anything at all because it was a hype moment. Um, but yeah, so so that's another uh, great uh, moment. But again, the context of that was still that even with a top from Kai, Tomoa only had to get to the zone, which was a walk in the park for everybody. Um, so it, it it was already kind of over, which is too bad. Yeah, that's that's why it was an A minus for me, and not an A. If yeah. if Tomoa had if it had, the scores had worked out so Tomoa like had to top it, mm -hmm. and then he did end up topping it for the win, I think I, maybe I would have given it an A. I think your point is well taken though. It's like I do feel like we you know we don't want to give ourselves a, a like kind of a low ceiling here um, because especially if we think about Yanya going for potentially a clean a sweep of the season, like if she would actually do that at a comp, that would be a huge deal. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, what if like she like at the same comp I mean, just hypothetically like think about if Yanya would do the clean sweep and then maybe there's also like a world record broken in one of the speed climbing you know it's like sure. it, well we already gave an A you know it's like we it, it's gonna get tricky because I do feel like um, let's just do it like climbing where we just decided to absolutely wreck how a decimal system works right. and just start cranking higher and higher we'll just make up new letters it's fine I give it an A minus point seven or yeah, something yeah whatever <laughs> Plus yeah, it's an A point one six. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but overall, I thought it was a great comp. Sounds like you did. Too. You do too. It was, yeah. I, just, I enjoyed it a lot, and I thought the route setting was great. Um, nice mix of veterans and and kind of new faces. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the greatest success was that I woke up to watch it live, which and I like, genuinely watching around live, makes it so much better. Um, 
I, I oh, yeah. have enjoyed, and it's extremely hard for these comps in terrible time zones. Um, but it it keeps me engaged. I don't know if other people feel the same way, but it makes it much easier for me to stay excited. Uh, so I'm glad I managed to actually wake up for it. In fact, I it was easier waking up for that than it was just to wake up for for this recording. So I'm I'm glad it worked out that way. Well, we're glad you're here. Yeah, me too, <laughs> man. Um, aside from that, I, I think I'm like pretty much done with reflections from the comp, but you mentioned earlier that you kind of had some feelings about like, um, story now that we're like kind of over halfway through the Boulder season, or basically at the halfway point, if you add the world championships, uh, that you wanted to talk about like the idea of broader storylines and kind of where we're at. And I thought that was a cool idea. I wanted to know what you were kind of feeling about that. Yeah. Well, so like what, just so people know we're on the, we're kind of at the midway point next is Munich and then Vail. And then the World Championships in August. Mm. Um, so we've had four comps, and then there are three remaining, right? Counting those, the World Championships. Including the World Championships, yes. So there's yeah. only two more left uh, in the World Cup season. So the like World Cup ranking, the overall Boulder ranking will be done after Vail, but then the World Championships uh, after that. Yeah. So we're kind of as 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 much as you could do a mid a midway recap reflection pe type of thing. I think we're kind of there. It's it's a nice spot because we're done with China. It, I think it would have been weird to do this in between uh, Chongqing and and Wujang. Sure. Um, so and the competitors get a weekend off coming up. So I was just kind of curious, looking back on the the four competitions that we've had on the whole, um, kind of what are some of your I don't know, like takeaways or, or what has been the most interesting storyline? Maybe what, like, how would you assess the Canadians overall performance on, you know, in those four? Sure. Yeah. I just kinda, I'd, I'd be curious to just kind of hear you riff on, on it. Well, uh, yeah. If you just want me to talk, that's my favorite thing to do is just to talk about <laughs> other people doing things. Uh, the Canadian thing is like extremely exactly what I thought it was going to be. Like, again, we've had, a, f a few of the climbers uh so okay well sean and alana are where they're at i know alana definitely wants to be in a final again she managed to do it before she wants to do that uh sean would also like to but his like and i i don't want to say this to make anybody feel bad but he's in my opinion towards the end of the career in general he hasn't been seeing those big finals achievements in general as much um i think sean Ching last year was the last time he made a boulder final if i remember right um, so they're doing as I expect. I hope for them that they can get the success they want because I really want to cheer for them in the finals. That would be so much fun. And I would be intolerable whenever we record the recap episode yeah. for it. Uh, for the rest of the Canadians, it's as expected. There have been a couple outliers where they've made semis in the past, but I, it's, it is unlikely. Um, I think the, the, the one thing that came up was, I, and my math might be wrong. I'll admit that right away, but I've already kind of checked for a couple of athletes to determine if Yanya has tied up the season gold, like the overall for the Boulder season. And I'm fairly certain she hasn't. I'm pretty sure Akio, and I don't think this is like for. I'll just say it. Yanya is going to be the the season champion for bouldering this year in the overall. No problem. That's like done. She just has to basically show up. Uh, but if she doesn't show up at all and there is no ranking points, uh, and if Akio manages to win the next two, which is not out of the realm of possibility at all, um, then uh, then Akio could actually win the overall. And so part of me is defending against the people that are saying that Yanya already wrapped it up, like for mm -hmm. real. Mathematically, I'm pretty sure that is not the case. Um, do the math yourself. It's actually fairly easy to see the explanation if you go to rankings. Um, but that also kind of pisses me off because she's won four out of the six. It bothers me that the math is possible that somebody who didn't show up to a World Cup already or like didn't uh, make finals in a Kyo, uh at Moscow it bothers me that Yanya hasn't wrapped it up yet. Like I know math is and trying to award ranking points is very complex and it is always going to be arbitrary in a certain way. But I wish we could say by now after, you know, winning four events in a row that she had wrapped it up. I feel like she deserves it already. She's going to get it. I'm fairly certain uh, at Munich, but uh, that's, that's kind of my vibe is I wish the math made it that it was a lock already. Yeah. It does seem kind of weird that it's like, she's won four out of the six which is more than half. So like, how could she not, you know, how could she not be the, the deemed the winner yet? Yeah. Um, that is a little weird statistically and whatnot. Well, I, and I, again, I don't know, like I, I've, I've tried to play around with ranking systems before, like for a year I did one for Canadian athletes and, and it, 
made me not want to exist as a person because it it is you realize how much of it is it, anyway it's difficult but i think if i put it this way like let's say akio had come second at the last four events which she did not but if she did come second at the last four events and then won the final two so she has two wins and four silvers i would still put somebody like yanya with four golds ahead of that person in my mind in terms of their ranking across a season even if yanya doesn't show up for the last two so if she yeah. comes out with and i that's that's just my opinion i'm kind of using the ranking as like a proxy for best climber of the year although that mathematically is not what it's for it's kind of this averaging out of everybody's climbing it's possible to podium in the world rankings and have not earned a medal all season like that's just possible and that's okay that's what it's for but it just seems like it's it's kind of like just bothering me a little bit yeah, i wish sure. we could say it was locked already yeah that's a good point i i'm not a stat uh, i'm not a stats like i'm not a stats minded person so that sort of stuff i don't really usually think about that stuff unless i really have to so i can't say that i've i've thought about it until you brought it up but um but that's an interesting point uh and yeah i don't know it's it's good point. Yeah. Well, what about you in terms of uh, stories so far? So I think uh, well, let's start with the Americans because I think the Americans it's kind of interesting. I've said this before. There was a lot of like Amer the U USA climbing and kind of by proxy the American climbing team. They had a lot of really great momentum going out of this like into this season mm -hmm. just because they they had signed this broadcast deal with ESPN over here in the states. They had. Um, Moved the headquarters of USA Climbing moved to Salt Lake City. They built this really elaborate um, training facility there, and they, um, you know, there was a lot of buzz around the first the combined invitational that they held here. So, uh, and starting in in um, in Meiringen, I think it was like Kyra Kani and Alex Johnson got like seventh and eighth or something mm -hmm. like that. So, so I was from the get go. I was thinking like, oh, the momentum is on this side of the Americans. They placed well in the first World Cup. It's only a matter of time until we see somebody, you know, an American in the finals, if not two Americans, maybe even in, yeah. the, in the finals. Um, hasn't really panned out that way, which has been kind of a bummer. It would have been awesome to see, just like you. Like, I think it'd be, I'd be, you know, ecstatic on these broadcasts if there would be uh, an American in the finals for one of these events. Um, but on the flip side, they've shown really great depth. Um at a lot of these comps, they've had a number of people kind of in the in the teens or in the twenties or in the or in the low thirties, um, more than more than just you know a couple competitors. There have been like clumps of competitors there, which is great, and I think that bodes really well if you're looking at the Olympics and how the qualification will work and how um, you know there's twenty from each, you know there's twenty men, twenty women, and there's only two from each country. So I think the fact that the Americans have shown some some depth. And been consistently in the teens or in the 20s in the rankings for these competitions. Uh, that kind of gives me, um, I'm, I'm kind of excited because that, I think that bodes well for their potential to actually have an American maybe qualify for the Olympics. Maybe, uh -huh. not, maybe not in the first round of qualification or something yeah. like that. But because there is this depth, uh, maybe, you know, in some of the later uh, opportunities to qualify, maybe an American will get in there. So Sure. Yeah, that's that's my that's my kind of thinking about the Americans so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited for the Americans in the rope season just because we've actually mm -hmm. seen Ashram a medal at a rope event and Sean Bailey. I can't remember if he medaled or not, but he saw a lot of success over the last couple seasons there. So it's weird because when I think of American international competitors, I mostly think of somebody like Alex Puccio and Alex Johnson as yeah. boulders. But in the last little bit, those successes, aside from Puccio, like tearing it up at Vail last year, um, has been from the rope side. That said, it's like tradition for an American to win Vail out of nowhere, basically. So mm -hmm. who knows, man? And like, what is it, four weeks from now? We might just see yeah. some like random show up, the new Megan Muscarinus. P.S. Where is she at? Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, as we'll see. Like Vale, Vale has some kind of magic about it where you guys managed to pull it together. I don't understand it. Yeah, I think, and and Sean Bailey is an interesting case, especially for the American fan base because he actually won bouldering nationals here in the U mm -hmm. in the U.S. this year. So I think um, like people were pretty stoked about him for this IFSC bouldering season. Um, but like at the end of the day, he's like his his bread and butter, the thing that he's traditionally crushed at is is the ropes. Yeah. And so uh, it'll be really interesting to watch him 
you know, I think I hope he does great. I I think he he's proved before that he can do great in on international in, in ropes. So we'll see. Yeah. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about also, I had reference, I messaged you to you about this. Are there any? Is there any bit of like storyline or just a news piece or something from the first half of the season that you feel like is like underreported or unappreciated or kind of something that you've noticed that hasn't been talked about? Um, hmm. <laughs> or, or just something that like hasn't gotten any attention. And now that we're a few comps into the season, you're like, oh, this is kind of, you know, this is interesting. That's a really good question because I. And what worries me is that I feel like I would also be one of those people that was like oblivious to the developing story. Uh, there has been a tension around how the average times of non-native speed climbers is dropping. They're still not going to win speed comps. Um, I, th I think it's like it's too early to tell any stories about qualification for the Olympics because the only thing you can predict right now is who would get to the second round, like the Toulouse qualifier. You really can't make any guesses at who will win the world championship because we haven't seen any rope climbing yet um i don't know i think that's a that's a, a really good question but i don't know if i have any answers for it i think the one thing that i wish was uh was talked about a little bit more um that i i kind of hope some discussion would come from it was in merrigan when custom holds were introduced um and I think you you pointed out that the IFSC did finish, I can't remember what they call it, but it's like an approved vendors list. So it's basically hold manufacturers that they permit their products to be used at, at World Cups. It's basically setting like a quality basement, I think is the idea, so that you don't just have like random shit showing up. It has to be from an approved manufacturer. It doesn't approve specific pieces, so you could hypothetically have a you know a technic or or a, a cheetah or whoever you could have them produce a one-off hold um still for an event so there's still like room for that but i i think the question of of uh of designing custom holds for comps is both intriguing and a little bit uh frightening um mm -hmm. in terms of a level playing field and a sport that's already very um very in my opinion not level it's only level because of the like the idea that there's randomness and and you never know what's going to come next but I'm a, I'm a little bit concerned to see how that develops towards uh, the olympics but i don't think i have any uh, any answers to that aside from mm -hmm. uh, from that those are good those are those are all good the whole thing is something we haven't really discussed on this on this little program but uh i think it was a smart move by the ifsc i'm kind of surprised it hadn't been enacted yet that they have kind of like a standard vendors list um I think that I, my guess is like because of how I don't have a lot of firsthand experience with this, but the event organizer has a ton of responsibility for providing the holds, at least in my understanding. That might be dated now. Maybe there's kind of a shared responsibility. Um, and it seems like there is kind of a set of holds that goes to each World Cup. Mm. But if you want to show off some new stuff or have really flashy climbs, you're kind of hoping that maybe a hold provider will sponsor your event or sell you some stuff at a discounted rate. So I think putting extra limits on what holds you can use could have been tough on the event organizers just because it it makes it harder for them to get sponsorship or support from hold companies if they're not on an approved list. That's, that's the first thought that comes to mind, sure. but I don't know for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, one thing that I, that I had thought of that is, I, I wrote it down here, I think something that... Um, that we haven't really touched on has just been the um, the uh, originally I, I when I was jotting this down I wrote down the the come Jan Hoyer's comeback um, okay but it, it's not really a comeback because I was looking <laughs> at his at his at his placement from last year um, and he was uh, let's see so in 2018 he got 18th in Meiringen he was 35th in Moscow so he definitely was kind of like down in the pack uh, but then he did come back he was fifth in Chongqing. Um, and then he kind of hopped around. He was in seventh. He was in twelfth. He was in tenth. So kind of inconsistent last year. Mm -hmm. And I know there was some chatter. Some people were just kind of like, you know, why aren't we seeing Jan in the finals like we were kind of used to a couple years ago? Um, but rather than a comeback, I kind of think it's more just like a steady, quiet improvement this season. You know, if we remember correctly, in Mayringen, he he didn't have his best um, his best performance in, in you know just a few months ago uh, a few weeks ago he was 21st but then in moscow he was 12th in chongqing he was 12th and in wujang he just this past weekend he was sixth 
Mm-hmm. So he's just kind of had this like steady. It's like he's creeping up the ladder. Seems to be kind of finding his top form again. Um, and I just thought that that was an interesting uh, observation, especially because Munich is on the horizon, and sure. he and that's like his home. You know, he'll get the home crowd or home nation uh, advantage or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just going to be really, really extra curious to see how Jan Hoyer does uh, the, in Munich. That's so, yeah, that's fair game. Like Munich, know, seeing uh, seeing how people succeed in in a new environment back in Europe and like a storied like a uh, event venue, um, and then yeah. Vale as well. They they could be interesting. Um, yeah. yeah, it'll it'll be neat to see. I, I can't say I've yeah. followed him too much just because he hasn't been particularly impressive in the last couple uh, years. So I don't think of him as somebody that I would put as a favorite. Like obviously, I would have my eyes more on somebody like Adam Andra or, in my opinion, like Yerne Cruder as well. At least for the Boulder season. Um, but yeah. yeah, but that's that, that's that's kind of my point. It's like we ha- we've kind of. You know, these past couple seasons, I think we've just kind of gotten used to maybe not seeing him in the finals as much as we mm-hmm. used to. Um, but then this season, it's like 21st, then he's 12th, then he's 12th, then he's 6th. So it's like all of a sudden he seems to kind of maybe be uh, uh, coming back a little bit, which is cool. I, I, you know, I like Jan and, and he's fun to watch climb. So Five bucks says he goes out in last place at Munich. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, that's the, uh, yeah, that's, let's, the, that's the new wager. Yeah, let's wrap this up. Uh, okay. So two weeks from now uh, will be the Munich World Cup. It's just bouldering. It's on a Saturday and a Sunday. I actually don't know if I'm going to be in town uh, for it. So this the recap episode might come out one or two days late. I actually, John, I haven't even told you this. I might be in Montreal uh, for okay. uh, Canadian lead and speed nationals. Um so if I'm not back at home by this recording computer, then we might have to wait a day or two, but we'll still do the episode um, just to keep it consistent. Otherwise, um, take a... Real fast, yeah. real fast. Uh, so I wanted to give a quick shout out to a couple people that were very vocal in our comments section last <laughs> last week, because this was really exciting. We Because this is something that you and I have said we want, we want people to uh, continue discussing these things you know, after after the show ends or whatever. And we want people, of course, to feel free to send us questions if they have topics they want us to discuss. Mm-hmm. But uh, CPT Gambit, Bob Cheeseman, and Rob Center One, those were the usernames. Um, they were they chimed in last last week for the comments in the comments section, which was awesome. We love to hear from people. Shout out also to Charlie Bosco and Eddie, who have chimed in in the past, um, which is always like a real, it's a real treat for us to hear from them because we know how busy they are. Um, and then I also got a little Instagram um, message from a guy uh, named Kessler from Iowa who uh, said he liked what we were doing, too. So and that, you know, I just wanted to say. Thanks. Yeah. Shout out to I, Ben. I, I haven't heard that. from him that's, in a while. Ben Kessler. That's, uh, it means a lot when people take the time to comment on this and kind of join the conversation. So. It does. Yeah. And again, if you have any feedback, keep letting us know. Um, we'll keep trying to make it as in as a. Uh, as engaging an experience, try and make it entertaining. But anyway, we'll uh, we'll cut it short because I got to start heading to work. Uh, but yeah, we will see you guys in a couple weeks. Uh, comment, like, subscribe if you have to. I feel so like so shame saying that, but anyway, <laughs> apparently it helps to remind people. But anyways, we'll see yeah. you guys in two weeks from Munich. Thanks for watching.